First, we have Mario giving a lecture about the topic Chunsengyin, where he will talk about Korean's perspectives and expectations towards native English teachers. Then we will have which will educate all of us on encouraging creativity in classroom. Please welcome Mario Podesky and Matt Tsumar. I can 
can see from this picture that the younger man is deferring to the authority of the older man. And that is a vertical social interaction, vertical politeness. And we'll talk a lot about that today. The Western greeting is much more horizontal. The first thing they do as equals, as professionals, is close the gap between them, offer a hand and firm eye contact, and say individual, equal, hello, greeting each other on the same page. I'm more comfortable with the Western way, but I'm starting to get used to the Korean way. And in the very least, even if you never get used to the Korean way, there's room to negotiate. So Korean social interactions are vertical in nature. They go up and down. A grandfather speaks informally to his grandchild. The grandchild speaks formally up to his child. So too in the interactions between president and voter, or between uh, uh, boss and employer. Western is more horizontal. Frankly, the last time someone called me sir was when I was refilling their coke in the restaurant. In Korea, we hear the questions, how old are you? And are you married? With some frequency. These are necessary pieces of small talk. Don't let them throw you off. The reason we ask, how old are you? And are you married? Is so that we can decide where we stand in that vertical politeness scale. It's a necessary part of the discussion. But over in the West, there's a slightly different connotation to, hey, how old are you? Are you married? Here in Korea, a casual relationship is somewhat rare because it requires being on an equal level, an equal plane of that vertical politeness. We usually see casual relationships among Koreans from someone who have been a part of an organization with a common goal, whether it be a group of students, a group of athletes, or a group of professionals. The rest of the time, they're speaking in different tones and with different levels of respect. But in a horizontal politeness, the goal is to get closer and closer, less and less formal. If I walk in and high-five my boss in a Western office, I'm telling all the world, boom, I'm in a good office. Now, my, my boss and I have a productive relationship, and we really kick back and have fun at the workplace. But boy, if I tried the high-five Wanchuk theme, I don't think it would go that well. <laughs> And here in Korea, you, you may have noticed this already, uh, they have a lot of hueishi, that drinking together with the co-workers, but this too fits into that vertical politeness scale. Drinking with co-workers, you can imagine it gets kind of exhausting trying to always know what verb tends to use with someone based on how old they are, are they married, uh, where are they at in the company. And so going out for drinks with co-workers is a way to loosen the bonds on that and to, to relax and kick back. It's an important vent for all of this formality. But how different is that from the Western perspective, where we try to keep our personal and our professional lives so very separate? A lot of talking about not going to the bathroom where you work or eat, there's all sorts of idioms built around that, and for us it's common wisdom. So I look at these differences, and I think, wow, as a Westerner, it's really the exact opposite, isn't it? Everything I've learned about working and professionalism, uh, all, all these rules have been switched on me. Uh, so what, what do I do? What's my perspective on this? And that's something I'd like to defer towards the end of the, pres of the presentation. Uh, then we have the parents. And I think with parents, there's a lot fewer opposites because you know, there's something universal about motherhood and about raising a child and hoping for your child's success. You try to put values into your child's arms, good values, like trying to raise a disciplined and industrious member of society. I don't think that's necessarily a Korean idea, but it's definitely a Korean priority. That isn't quite the same as the priority I see for a Western mother who wants their child to be happy and expressive and an individual among individuals. Both of these are really cool. I believe in both of these concepts. But what steers the car towards decisions about a child's education are a little bit different. And thus, sometimes we see some differences in how the mothering is approached. Modesty, for example. I once had a mother who, of the smartest kid I'd ever taught. And as soon as I met her, I was not surprised to find out that she spoke remarkable English. And I was like, oh great, I get to, I get to talk about my awesome kid. And I say, hey, mom, your kid is so smart and awesome. I, I, it, every day is a pleasure to teach with him. And it's like, oh, he's kind of lazy. 
and he's not that good at English. And it, I was kind of new and, and taken aback. I'm like, well, why would you say that about your kid? Your kid is awesome. He's like the smartest person I've ever met, and he's 10. <laughs> but as I've been here for a while, I, I have started to feel out that this modesty is also a Korean virtue. And I contrast it with the Western virtue of positive reinforcement, which is what I felt was missing in that interaction. Positive reinforcement being that, that oh, you are, you are so smart and so bright. That is a wonderful scribble. Is that a plate of spaghetti? No, it's a racetrack. Oh, you are a genius. <laughs> and I, I think that that constant positive reinforcement is a bit less, uh, can be a bit annoying to someone coming from a Korean perspective. Just like how constant modesty can be a little off-putting to a teacher who just wants to cheer, cheer on this kid who is doing so well in class. Korean mothers usually provide for private education. I, correct, let me correct myself. Korean families usually provide for private education. And that is a big deal here. Families are willing to bankrupt themselves, to live in tiny little apartments, just so they can send their kids to their third hagwon and make sure they can get 14 hours of good education every day. I exaggerate, but this continues all the way through college. Student loan debt is a surprisingly Western problem, and not so big of a deal here in Korea. But student loan debt has its merits too, I think. <laughs> Coming from a Western bootstrap mentality, you turn 18, you leave the house, you're an adult, sink or swim. And I think there's something good to that too. And where do they land? And this is something very similar with just one small difference. Korean parents and Western parents are going to communicate with and make requests of teachers because they are invested. The only difference is, is that there's a language barrier in the way that often muddles the message. As now, to be a translator is a lifetime profession, and a professional translator is something most schools can't really afford. And thus, requests from parents, as they get passed through the grapevine, sometimes come across as just sounding silly, because we don't have the cultural context. So, a tiny piece of advice that I can offer from that observation is uh, be, be patient with them and understand that uh, uh, sometimes they just don't have the ability to express themselves in a way that is going to make you feel good about moving their kid or doing that other practice book page or whatever request that they've made of you. And fundamentally our goals are all the same. The students, the biggest deal of everything that we're doing. Korean students, Read you as sun name, and I, I'd like to unpack that word. That name at the end is a term of the highest honor. We see in words like grandfather, in words like vice president, in words like Buddha, and in words like God. And they're calling us this every day. Teacher, teacher, teacher. They're making a direct translation from sun name to teacher because it's the closest that we have. But it is a different word. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. I talked for a while in the West, and when I did, I was called Mr. Mario. And Mr. pretty much means you're a grown-up. <laughs> so that's something I like here. <laughs> a Korean student will look down to show that they accept their punishment and that they're sorry that they did it. Uh, this is now earlier. It's showing deference in a vertical politeness system. Compare that to the Western child, who looks down to show that I'm not really listening to you. <laughs> Which can lead to a tragedy among starting teachers who come to Korea. Well-intentioned, we know that we have to establish a firm classroom discipline from the first day. And so we start doing it. And a student acts up, inevitably. We say, hey, uh, I need to talk to you for a moment. And they lower their eyes to show that they accept their scolding, that they're sorry they'll never do it again. And then the bad thing happens. Hey, look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> what a terrible thing for a child to go through. Unable to sincerely apologize to their teacher, even though they feel bad about it. And why? Because they have not yet mastered the very difficult linguistic technique of speaking English with their eyes. Please be careful. Korean students are used to a classroom where the teacher speaks in the current and the student listens. Compare that to the Western classroom, where classroom discussion and that horizontal communication is more the order of the day. This is a pretty exciting point, actually. We 
because it's not a tough sell to convince Korean parents that a discussion-based classroom is a good way to learn language. But being behind the idea doesn't necessarily equip our students to succeed in the idea right away. Sometimes I walk into a classroom, I've got this great discussion worked out, I've got all my, all my ducks in a row, and I'm, I'm just ready to have the best conversation they've ever had, and no one will say a word. They're not disrespecting me. They're not sorry to be there. But they aren't really that used to that environment, and I've got to lead them on baby steps. I have to teach them how to be taught in this system that they've never been in before. And our Korean students do have their problems. And this is an obstacle I'm sure all of you have a lot of trouble swallowing, that they can come to class exhausted. So walking in, saying, dark circles under the eyes, teacher, teacher, I slept three hours last night. I had 10 tests last week. I have to stay up until 11. I go to 20 hot ones. <laughs> it's hard to tell them no. It's hard to not want to reach out, especially coming from our Western perspective, where these kind of things just don't happen. But it's just an obstacle. And obstacles are always there when you're teaching. And it's not like the West doesn't have an mm -hmm. obstacle, too. Uh, I know we have people from a lot of countries here, but speaking from my own perspective of the United States, kids forget a lot in those three month breaks they get to harvest the crops in the 21st century. <laughs> and that's something teachers have to deal with, too. And it's really, really hard. And if a Korean came to teach, Korean to a bunch of high schoolers back in the States, I think that they would be a little frustrated by that. So be aware that every country has its problems, every country has its obstacles, and that having an obstacle does not exempt us from teaching like champions. We have to find a way. Because if the kid is there, that means that all of the constituents, every other perspective, parent, administration, and our host country is agreed, they can learn today. And I think they can. Kids are really tough and they're really smart. And if we can keep our energy levels up, so will they. And that brings us to us. What do we make of all of this? Being Westerners in often opposite values and ways of communication. Well, there's one thing I can say about us. We are adventurers, aren't we? <laughs> Leaving home every part-time we worked at and coming here. And why? Because it's an opportunity, an awesome opportunity. An opportunity to get full-time work in education. Boy, that's hard to find in my home country. Coming here, we develop our resumes in a really awesome way. Uh, last time I went home, everyone was asking, hey, you've been in Korea for a while. Uh, when are you coming home? And I kept telling them, I don't know. But in the back of my head, I thought, but when I do, I'm going to be really cool. <laughs> Especially looking at my, my peers who also graduated from education that are still working in coffee shops. This is a wonderful opportunity. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be building my resume with something so interesting. Korea. Korea, the home of such famous figures as Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and this guy who I think sells Samsung phones. <laughs> We're the eyes and ears of loved ones back home. When they see Korea on the news, and it's on the news a lot, we're the first people they call. And we get to give them the review from the front row seat. How's it going over there? Oh, we're fine. We're actually not as worried as you seem to be. <laughs> and yes, everyone is still singing Gangnam Style. <laughs> and despite all that, I must admit, every day I feel like I'm a little over my head. And I'm sure you do too. Uh, especially that last point, that, that price of education, trying to like bridge that gap something so, so foreign and potentially offensive. Uh, uh, but to, when keeping perspective in mind, when we look closely, sometimes we see things aren't exactly what they seem on the surface, because kids will be kids. And if anyone here has studied Korean, this sad-looking Korean boy who's begging for your mercy and, and to not give you a has written the words, I am bored, under his help me sign. And thus, we have to find our perspective. Speaking Korean, bending over backwards, carrying us wherever we need to go, buying us plane tickets, and paying us a pretty competitive salary. And then we have our parents, the, the ones who fund this grand experiment in education. Highly critical, but also with a bit of faith, ready to make sacrifices so that their kids can learn from us. 
And then the kids themselves, the real reason for teaching, the reason that all of this is so, so important. And then you in the middle. So I'd like to leave you with three pieces of advice. I'd like to invite you to take them. You don't have to. But firstly, try to keep perspective in mind, because there's 50 million people in and all of them are different. And a few hundred of them are us, and some will be jerks, and some will be awesome, and some will know a lot about education, and some will think that education should be done uh, with shackles. Uh, there's, there's room for interpretation there uh, among everyone. Everyone's different. Everyone has an opinion on it. And withhold judgment as best you can, because since we don't speak Korean, it's kind of hard to know just from what, some, what someone translated to us exactly what someone's perspective was when they said something to us or asked something of us. And most of all, uh, do embrace this opportunity. Uh, uh, you are teachers. Uh, ever since Frederick Douglass, Socrates, and a whack of other people have all said that education and learning are the most pure and powerful forces of good in the universe. I believe that, and I hope you do too. Thank you.